Hi, I'm Jonathan Weinberg. Um, I just got back, or about a, a week ago, I got back from the DC Pen Show, which is supposedly the world's largest pen show, and um, it was it was extremely interesting. Um, it is overwhelmingly big. Um, there, um, it, it takes place not in downtown Washington, actually, it takes place in um, Virginia, in uh, Falls um, River Church, excuse me, Falls Church, Virginia, which is a suburb of, of Washington, D.C. And um, it takes place for three days. It was uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And there were well over 300, I think the 400 vendors. It takes up the entire um, sort of, of all the different rooms, ballrooms and convention rooms in a, a rather small Marriott hotel, which is a kind of corporate hotel in what looks to me like a kind of one of those sort of corporate office parks. Um, one, one disappointment for me is that usually in these Marriott's there's a swimming pool, and I think there used to be a swimming pool at this particular Marriott outside, but I think uh, post-COVID they, they did away with it, so I was kind of bummed out by that. Anyway, um, uh, and, and it has a small bar, not a, not a, and, it, and it, there wasn't even a restaurant, a regular restaurant. I mean, there was kind of a little area where they had food, et cetera, et cetera, because I think the Fountain Pen Show took up so so much space, right? All the regular areas. Um, um, I was really glad that we um, were able to get, you know, we booked way in advance and it was very, it was fairly reasonable to stay at the convention hotel. And if you're somebody who's really intensely interested in fountain pens and really plans to spend all your time at this um, event, I really recommend that. I also have to say it takes a long time to drive all the way down there from New Haven and we didn't get there till after Friday. I had hoped to get there earlier on Friday and didn't get there really till um, after the show had closed on Friday. And as so many people say, the best time to say, and they charge you extra to do this, to see one of these huge shows is on Friday when it's not so crowded and there's a special ticket and then you can really, you, you were able to really concentrate. On Saturday, it was just crazy how many people were there. I was able to get in early and able to talk to the people that I really wanted to talk to. I've become recently kind of really excited by um, handmade, I guess one could call them hand-turned artisan fountain pens. These are fountain pens that small makers like um, Caroline Pen Company, Jonathan Brooks, or um, Sean Newton, or Smith at Derail Pens makes makes these kinds of pens, um, often made from well made from uh, blanks um, that they purchase. Sometimes they make their own blanks, or they get blanks from other people like Jonathan Brooks, and they make and I think they make these beautiful pens. And it's to me amazing that not just that you can get these pens but just you can talk to the makers if you go to the pen shows. So for me, that's like the number one thing so far that I enjoy most about this. And I sort of fell into that when I was at the Baltimore Pen Show and was able to talk to Jonathan Brooks, who I'd seen on all these different videos. And I just was so charmed by the fact that somebody within a community who's so well known that you can come, you can talk to, he's very open, he's a very nice guy and you can get a fountain pen from him for you know two hundred dollars and he will customize the nib for you a little bit and you know that that's really cool you know there's i don't i don't know how many you know it's not that unlike buying a work of art from an, an unknown artist right and going to their studio and getting a work of art art for them but there aren't a lot of machine made things that um you can write with that use in your everyday life, you know, like that, that are actually um, made by someone. I guess, you know, in a way it makes me nostalgic for the early days when I bought my first word processing computer and there were people who were putting computers together and you could get a computer, sort of a PC compatible that somebody put the pieces together. 
and you knew them and they would kind of help you tinker with it, right? So there's that aspect to that's still true of fountain pens within this world of uh, buying work, uh, fountain pens from, from small makers. And um, fountain pen shows are a great way to meet these people because they come from all over the place. Like Sean Newtown, Newtown is from um, Arkansas. There you go. Say, well, say something. Uh, hey, so I'm Sean Newton. I make fountain pens and ball points. I give scholarships to high school kids going to college. We're based in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I've uh, been doing this since 2012. Um, Great. <laughs> I met a pen maker who I didn't know about um, at the DC Pen Show from Columbus, Ohio. I spent a lot of time with my curating with the Columbus Art Museum, and I didn't know that there was a great pen maker there. He's been making pens for for 30 years, and um, one of his pens just caught my attention. I had to had to buy it, and I was able to talk with him. Say something. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adolphus from Yorel Pens. I've been an attorney for over 30 years and made some town pens for the last 10 years. Terrific. And I was also excited to see my good friends, the uh, Bagdas family, and their fantastic uh, day art store. They had all kinds of things that really go with fountain pens. They um, sort of specialize in selling um, all kind of equipment that goes with um, with the hobby of wax seals, and I was really excited to see that they had this cute little Lacuan um, seal um, that I ended up buying, um, and um, so they were there, and there were many many other stationary um, uh, 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 people selling uh, leather covers and notebooks and pads and uh, ink and you know anything that could go with pens and fountain pens and it's not just fountain pens it's ballpoint pens and all kinds of pens so there you go it was uh, it, it, it was overwhelming huh? another thing that uh, you'll find at these um, shows are um, nib smiths people like josh Lax and um I got some help, um, actually completely free advice from Mark Backus, and, uh, who is uh, a really wonderful nib smith uh, about a pen that I was having some trouble with. Um, and the thing about that is that you have to be sure, if you can, to schedule appointments. Um, the nib smiths will have on their websites uh, a schedule of when they're going to be at the pen show and usually a few weeks beforehand, even a few weeks beforehand, you can start signing up for times and then be able to see, bring your pen to them and they will do their wonders. To me, um, as a art historian and an artist, they somewhat reminded me of the huge College Art Association gatherings because it's full of people, many, many people who know each other and then, of course, it's full of people from Washington who many people, I think, were not even that involved with fountain pens, but had heard about it and are excited to see these kind of things. And it reminds me of a little bit of a car show. Anyway, it's a real scene. And, um, and I think also there's a lot of socializing that goes on in between and at night and again with people that know each other. People are very friendly. So, but it, But still, I find it intimidating because there's so much going on and also i i'm very into art in washington so to me the idea of the uh, ideal thing what i was hoping to do more of was not just see the fountain pen show but go into washington and which i did do and go to the national gallery and see art so i wasn't just there to um to look at fountain pens anyway it, it it's incredibly efficient in terms of seeing tremendous amount of fountain pens, a lot of new pens, almost all the major companies like um, Yaffa brand, all of Yaffa brands were there, Pilot was there, Visconti was there, um, also um, smaller companies like um, Osprey, which I think is a very interesting pen company that kind of focuses on different kinds of nibs that particularly calligraphers and artists use. They um, 
they import a lot of uh, pens from uh, India and um, I've used their pens. I, I have never gotten around to reviewing them here, but I, I will, I hope. And it was really cool to be able to see them. They are from Texas. Um, so they were there. There's the opportunity to meet pen makers like Pierre at Desterada Pens out of Chicago. He's a pen maker who has been fo uh, focusing on making a modern flex pen that uses um, uh, zebra nibs um, and um, there has a kind of following and his pens are really quite quite beautiful. I talked to him for a little while right in the beginning um, and um, and you know it's it's cool to be able to discuss these things with the actual person who owns the company um, or or creates the thing. Um, same thing with talking to the people at Shown Design. Um, there was, um, I'm trying to, it's almost like who, who wasn't there really, you know, there was Franklin Kristoff and of course, Sean Design was there. Um, there were seminars, there were all kinds of things going on. And I only really was there for several hours. So I am no, no expert on, on even this, you know, I'm no expert on fountain pens. I think ultimately I'm somebody who is very enthusiastic about them. Um, but uh, if you are, if you want to see sort of every detail of the place, I don't even know if he's able to do it, but Mike Matheson, who I talked to early on and have met, um, this is my second time meeting him. He's a great guy. He does a really amazing tour of the um, DC Pen Show. And also he has some, um, uh, on, his, on his YouTube channel, he has some sort of guides to what you should do when you're going to um, such a show. I mean, the, the dangers of shows like that for somebody like me too is because I did buy several fountain pens is, you know, spending too much. That's one thing. And then also you kind of lose focus because there's so much to be seen. It isn't just um, fountain pens. There are stationary um, uh, stores, there are people selling, um, there's like people even selling chocolate and food and all kinds of things that relate, might relate to fountain pens. There are some artists, there are all kinds of things going on. There are people who are selling, um, uh, uh notebooks and leather bound books and, and th things to hold fountain pens. So there's just a huge, huge amount of things happening. And I, I, I would say for me, at least now in my life, that it's too busy, too much going on. Um, I, I enjoyed the Baltimore Pen Show, which was maybe two thirds as big, but I, you know, it, it felt, or maybe the where it was, it had more room. I don't know. It felt less crowded than the DC Pen Show and a little less hectic. Um, the Fountain Pen Show had plenty of, um, uh, of vintage pen dealers, but it seemed to me that the emphasis or the kind of vibe of it was more uh, focused on contemporary fountain pens. You know, and a lot of the I think I, I you know, I may I have no way of knowing, you know, how what kinds of sales were being done. But it seemed to a lot of the people that I talked to who were, you know, just coming to the show seemed most interested in getting, um, and I shouldn't say just fountain pens. There were lots of people buying regular pens because it isn't just fountain pens. It's, it's all, all kinds of pens. Um, a lot of the people there were, were purchasing things that were not necessarily vintage or used. Um, so that, that's an aspect of it. But there were plenty of, there were certainly plenty of vintage pen dealers. I wasn't really there looking for that. I was most interested in, because as I said, I've become most interested in, in looking at hand turned pens, um, things like this beautiful pen that I got from um, Caroline Pen Country from Jonathan Brooks and, and being able, I really wanted to be there early on so that I could get a, a great you know, choice of selection of, uh, of pens. Uh, uh, these are the three um, pens that I got from Jonathan Brooks very early on in the show. And um, I was particularly um, charmed by this this green one because I think it's very unusual. You don't see 
a lot of contemporary um, fountain pens. I think in this, this is called Copper Line, and um, it it really is, I think, an amazing color, and um, I very much like this shape. This is what I got last time when I was in um, Baltimore. I got one of these pens, and I first met Jonathan Brooks, and I sort of decided, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, I am now uh, addicted to his his pens, and I'm gonna sort of follow his different materials um, and blanks. Brooks has really become, you know, I think probably the preeminent maker of fountain pen blanks. And now um, there are so many companies like Leonardo, and I know I saw that um, uh, now uh, Narval are are using Brooks blanks in their in their pens. Um, I I like when I I've, I've come to feel, and probably maybe I'll change, but. I've come to feel that when you're talking about this style of fountain pen, of a contemporary turned fountain pen, that I like it when it's as clean and as much about the material as it possibly can be. Um, it's interesting to compare um, the pens that, that Brooks makes, which have these sort of very simple um, unendorned, unendorned um, forms. Um, it's nice, nice for me. I, this is the first time I got one that isn't um, shiny, right? I wanted to, I thought it would be cool to have a pen that um, sort of shows you the difference between having one that is highly polished and one that is where you can really see it's less polished, but it in a way is more translucent. Um, and that's a nice contrast. And also, I, I, this was a pen when I was talking with Jonathan, um, you know, these two pens, these were ones that were suggested by him and his, and the colleague who was working with him, you know, they said, oh, these are ones that are favorites. So I like that idea. This one in particular, he said was a favorite. Um, I stupidly forgot to ask, um, you know, what they're called. And it's interesting that sometimes Jonathan doesn't know what they're called or forgets or in some senses they don't even have a name um, and also even if they have a name each one is is going to be different they're never that's another thing that's kind of fabulous about them they're never the same so I think that's very cool um, uh, I know that this one is called definitely called copper line and I know that there's a a a, a um, one of the materials which is called combustion and I think there's one that's called opal so there it's somewhere in that you know it's it's definitely one of the ones that he makes and um, and has um, you know some of them are different in that they have a kind of glitter to them um, this one here I don't know if you can see it it actually does glitter it has a glittery quality to it while this is more translucent it's almost like glass this is highly polished. Now, I, as I say, I have come to feel that with these kinds of materials, I really like it when it's completely unadorned, right? Um, it's interesting to compare what happens uh, when you take one of Brooks's materials and it's turned into a more traditional, luxurious fountain pen. And I happen to have uh, a really, you know, was on sale and I really stuck my neck out and bought one of the Leonardo pens and this is a certainly a very beautiful pen and it has you know a lovely clip and all that but I actually like it without all that right and it also has the benefit of being less expensive now this actually has a gold nib so if you get a Leonardo with the Jonathan Brooks material um, well no I don't know I don't know if you can get one that is under 200 or around 200 dollars i don't know if they make that they tend to be their higher end pens that are that have 14 karat nibs but um certainly you can get um narval makes a, a brooks pen that um is under 200 dollars that that would be in more traditional form and looks more like one of their pens so so there are pen manufacturers who are using brooks's materials and are competitively priced but um, as I say I think if you're really 
looking for a pen that is going to bring out the quality of this um, of the you know the sparkle and the and the depth of this material um, that it, you, you almost want it not to have all this other stuff. The other thing I have to say too is that the pen itself it's very light but it's large and it's very comfortable. I really like writing with it. The disadvantage is that this particular model does not um, post. And I suppose too that given the fact that the whole point is to uh, sort of treasure this kind of uh, pen body, maybe posting isn't a good idea anyway. It will scratch. I don't. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, so that's something that you have to often care, think about. If posting is something that you care about with a pen that is hand turned. Um, then that is something really remember to ask about because I have noticed that for the, often hand turned pens do not post and um, uh, for whatever reason and um, you know that always is something that I, for some reason I only think about after the after the fact I do like pens that post but I think as I'm getting more and more into fountain pens it matters less and less to me and things like clips don't matter as much also because I realize well how much am I going to really clip a pen to my pocket you know it's not really my style anyway and um, you know it's fine if it doesn't clip so much. Um, also it was exciting because I got to meet um, Alf Adolfo Smith the rail pens from Columbus and this is his one of his pens and uh, I talked to him for a little while and um, you know, I didn't know anything about his fountain pens, and I just was charmed by this. You know, this is one of those examples that I saw it, and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not going to buy that. Um, you know, I like that a lot. There are probably other things. And then I kept coming back to it, and there was only one of them. And I, I love this fountain pen. I think it's just, you know, it's very unusual looking. And then um, one of the things that is just marvelous, I think about it, um, you know, I'm not going to do a full review. It's, it uses a num number six Jovo nib, but it's how beautifully he took the pattern and, so, and, and, and made it fit the cap so that the green would match up here, right? And that is just so nicely done. And it, it's like a little fountain pen and like a pair of pajamas, like a kid's pajamas. I just think this, I'm sorry, I just think this is the most charming, charming pen. It just makes me smile, right? So anyway, I'm very, you know, this is a delightful thing to have. It writes beautifully. It's a Jovo nib, so it's not, you know, it doesn't write in any special way, but it, he, he, you know, he made sure that it writes smoothly. It has a broad uh, nib, and it's, it's just delightful. Um, another person that I met, and I get really giddy talking about this because I, these people are sort of like heroes of mine. Um, is uh, Sean Newton um, of Newton Newton Pens. Um, Sean is famous in the fountain pen community because he runs a scholarship program where people donate pens and he sells them on eBay and then he gives scholarships to high school students. And he's a friend of a wonderful artist, Jameson O'Don, who's a wonderful uh, illustrator or, uh, and um, old friend and uh, the, he sort of said you know go look him up and um, uh, you know I, I had read about him I'd even bought some of his pens but I you know I didn't realize he was going to be there and so it was really great to talk to him and um, he seems like a wonderful person he's from Arkansas so um, Sean Newton is from Ar Arkansas uh, Hot Springs Arkansas um, it was great to talk to him um, I got, and again, a really, I think this really wonderful pen. This is a, a syringe pen. Um, it has a kind of unusual um, way that it fills, which um, I think I'll review it in another, another um, uh, time. But basically what happens is this comes off, the bottom comes off as a, they call it blind cap on the bottom. And then you, like a syringe, you pull it in and out to fill it. And that's a kind of system that they used to use, I think, in the 40s, I think he told me. 
And um, so I really like this pen. It's very, very unusual looking. It feels wonderful in the hand. He spends a lot of time thinking about how a fountain pen feels and how it should how it should perform in your hand, right? Again, this uses a number six Jovo nib. So these you know, when you're in this sort of world of handmade fountain pens, hand turned fountain pens, it's really about the body and how it looks and how it feels in the hand. And the nibs tend to be a standard nib. They tend to you, people tend to seem to folk using Jovo nibs rather than Bach nibs. But um, you know, it will take uh, these pens will take uh, other number six nibs. So that. Uh, so to sum up, um, the DC show was really exciting. Um, I wish I'd had more time there. I wish I'd made it there on Friday. Um, definitely, if you do go, try to be able to go where you can go in the preview on the Friday preview and pay the extra when it's not so crowded. That would be my recommendation. Um, I, I, of the three pen shows that I've gone to so far, I would say the middle size one, the Baltimore one was my favorite. Boston, I think was too, it wasn't that it was too small, but I think it was too much vintage pens for me. I like the mix in Baltimore, both the vintage uh, dealers and the new dealers, the new pen makers. And that combination, I think, is very um, exciting. Um, in Boston, um, there were not that many of the people who make their own pens. So that would have been not as exciting for me. Although at that point, I wasn't really looking at that. At that. So Baltimore had a really good, good mix. Um, Washington, as I say, was too, a bit too big, so it's the kind of uh, Goldilocks thing. Do you, you know, what size pen show do you do you need? And I, you know, I also think that the more I will get to, the more I know people, the more I'm used to it, the more I know what I'm going to be seeing, the more relaxed I will be in, at these kinds of uh, events. So that's also part of the whole um, fountain pen. Um, uh, experience, I think, as you become more and more used to the place and you begin to see people that you know and you begin to hang out, they become much more social situations and less about just sort of watching and feeling intimidated. And so that takes that takes time, I think. Um, I think also I, I get into a kind of mode where I get a little guilty if I talk to somebody, I feel like I have to buy something. And I think people really just want to, often just want to talk. They don't expect to, you to, to buy things, but, you know, you, you have to sort of get out of that mode of thinking. But the other, the other part of it is that when it's so busy, um, you know, people are there to sell things and everybody is sort of looking over each other's shoulder and there's so much going on that it's very hard to focus. So that's that's part of the the tricky part of this whole um, experience, right? It's it's um, it's a lot going on, and um, you know, and that's you know that's that's part of the whole the whole excitement, and also part of the the problem, right? Because it's it's difficult to um, concentrate. So that's my. Um, kind of ambivalent experience so far at fountain pens uh, 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 shows, and I am sure that I'm going to continue to um, to go. I I have this desire also at some point to you know be one of the people behind the table and and sell something. I think that's a very different perspective if you're just sitting there and watching the people going by and talking to everybody than the perspective of somebody who's going and buying. And a lot of times I think the people who are talking to you the uh, on YouTube, uh, many in many cases there are people who actually are participating in the shows. They're selling pens, so they're very close friends with people who are selling pens. So um, they sort of see it from a different standpoint than somebody who's just going to buy something and, and shopping, right? I think that's a very different, a different experience. And that's always, you know, that's true 
too about the whole YouTube thing too is that if you're somebody who's just starting out with fountain pens and using a pen and you're getting advice from somebody who is using dozens and dozens of pens that's always something to keep in mind it's always it's 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 very it's always very different perspectives okay well uh, if as always if this is of any interest to you please subscribe we're getting close to 500 subscribers which is exciting it means a lot to me to hear your comments and to hear about your experiences and um, I'll see you next time